The University of Sydney has long been committed to seeing ideas discussed not only here in the quadrangle but more broadly in the city and it is a tremendous um, privilege to be able to cooperate with the US Study Centre in the hosting of this lecture this evening. And it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Peter J. Katzenstein, who's the Walter S. Carpenter Junior Professor of International Studies at Cornell University. He's also the current president of the American Political Science Association, the world's leading professional organization for the study of political science that serves over 15,000 members in 80 countries. Member of both the American Academy of Arts and Science and the American Philosophical Society, Professor Katzenstein is one of the world's most influential political scientists, making seminal contributions to the study of politics, both within countries and also amongst them. Since joining the Cornell Government Department in 1973, Katzenstein has chaired more than 100 PhD theses. He's received Cornell's Distinguished Teaching Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching and was one of, made one of Cornell University's Stephen H. Weiss Presidential Fellows for service to the university in 2004. Professor Katzenstein is the author and editor of more than 30 books and monographs and over 100 articles and book chapters. Whoever said that good researchers couldn't be good teachers or good teachers good researchers. He is currently a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. His current research interests focus on the politics of civilizational states, on questions of public diplomacy, law, religion and popular culture, on the role of anti-imperial sentiments, particularly anti-Americanism, on regionalism in world politics and German politics. And so it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Katzenstein to offer a critique entitled, Why the Clash of Civilizations is Wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael and Jeff, for this gracious introduction. Uh, if it took Jeff 15 years to understand my ideas, he's setting the bar either very low or very high. You'll decide at the end of this lecture. Uh, and then I want to just say apologies for my sniffles at the beginning of the lecture. I arrived here on an airplane trip which made me sick. So. This lecture inquires into two existential positions that concern Robert Frost in, his, in this excerpt from his poem, Mending Walls. Here's Frost. Before I built a wall, I'd asked to know what I was walling in or walling out, and to whom I was like to give offense. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that wants it down. And here's Frost's neighbor, as described in the same poem. He will not go behind his father's saying, and he likes having thought of it so well, he says again, good fences make good neighbors. I would like to explore in this lecture what these two positions entail for our understanding of civilization and world politics. I will start with an exposition of the underlying theory of civilizational politics before illustrating my central point with specific reference to China and America and ending this lecture with a brief recapitulation and conclusion. Civilizations are based on urban forms of life and the division of labor by which urban elites extract resources from peasants. There are two basic views on civilization. I argue here for a pluralist view that, that makes civilizations embedded in a global ecumene. This ecumene describes a universal system of knowledge and practices that differs from a competitive international state system reinforcing civilizational unity. At the center of civilizational complexes, we typically find religious traditions which at times intermingle with literary ones. An alternative view of civilizations holds that they are unitary cultural programs organized hierarchically around uncontested core values that yield unambiguous criteria for judging good conduct. This view was a European invention of the 18th century, and in the 19th century, it was enshrined in the doctrine of one standard of civilization. That standard was grounded in race, ethnic affiliation, religion, 
and a firm belief in the superiority of European civilization over all others. The distinction between civilized and uncivilized peoples is not specific to the European past. It enjoys broad support today among many conservative supporters of Huntington's thesis of the Clash of Civilizations, a book that was translated into 39 languages. It is also held by many liberals who are committed to improving the rule of law and global standards of good governance. Furthermore, the unitary argument is widely used by non-Europeans in their analysis of civilizational politics. Everywhere and at all times, barbarians have knocked on the doors of civilizations. Civilizations, I argue here, are pluralist. Islam, for example, does not cohere around religious fundamentalist values. Instead, just like China and America, Islam experiences conflicts over contested truth it reflecting its internal pluralism and its external context. Since it is a vast subject, let me offer here only a few illustrations from this case, leaving aside similar evidence easily adduced for Europe, India, Japan, Africa, and Russia. Islam is instructive because it illustrates a territorially loosely integrated and decentralized civilizational complex. Furthermore, Islam's stateless polity is often thought to be antagonistic to both China and America. The first major scholar of civilizations was the 15th century Islamic scholar Ibn Khaldun, who sought to adjudicate among the claims of different strands of Islam, which existed then as they exist today. In the spirit of Khaldun, the founder of modern Islamic studies in the United States, Marshall Hodgson, has counted the opening line in, uh, in Kipling's famous Ballad of East and West, Oh, East is East, and West is West, and never the twain shall meet. According to Hodgson, Islam belongs neither to East nor West. A truly global civilization, is, is Islam is a bridge between both. In the past, the Indian Ocean was for this global civilization the center for the blending of different Islamic traditions, including Persian, Southeast Asian, Arabian, Ottoman, and South Asian. Today, this rich legacy continues undiminished. Hyphenated Islam, as in the existence of a rich polyglot Afro-Islam, a vigorous debate over Euro-Islam, and a pragmatic Islam in Southeast and Central Asia contrast with an internally deeply divided Islam in the Middle East and in North Africa. Unitary conceptions assume that civilizations are culturally cohesive and that their collective identities are unchanging. Because of both the recent and the distant history of the West, this is implausible for both questions of security and political economy. Recently, after World War II, the most determined enemy of the West, Germany, was firmly integrated into a coalition of Western civilized democracies that were seeking to stem the tide of Eastern uncivilized autocracies. Furthermore, in the second half of the 20th century, despite the importance of Anglo-American models, varieties of capitalist democracies have remained distinct, a distinctive feature of the West. In contrast to this pluralist view, Samuel Huntington's clash of civilization restates the old unitary thesis for our times. His became arguably the most influential book published on international relations since the end of the Cold War. For Huntington, civilizations are coherent, consensual, invariant, and equipped with a state-like capacity to act. Huntington succeeded brilliantly in his objective of providing a new paradigm for looking at world politics after the end of the Cold War. His correct anticipation of 9-11 gave the book a claim to validity that helps account for its continued relevance. Less noticed in public than in academic discourse is the fact that Huntington greatly overstates his case. Numerous analyses have established beyond any reasonable doubt that clashes occur primarily within rather than between civilizations. Furthermore, the book's appeal has not been undermined by the failure of the second of its main claims. Since the end of the Cold War, the relations between the cynic and American civilizations are summarized best by terms such as encounter 
or engagement rather than clash. <coughs> Excuse me. In rethinking civilizational analysis, however, it would be a big mistake to focus only on Huntington's writing. Huntington insisted on a unitary conception of civilizations, but accepted multiple standards of proper conduct in a world of numerous civilizations. Liberals follow an inverse logic. Unlike Huntington, they are often more willing to acknowledge the existence of diverse cultural programs in a given civilization. And unlike Huntington, they have a difficult time <clears throat> letting go of the notion of a single standard of good international and intercivilizational conduct. This is illustrated by vigorous and extended debates over failing states, standards of good governance, property rights, and transparent markets. On all of these issues, and many others, liberal arguments often proceed from the unquestioned assumption of the existence of a single standard of good conduct. In liberal American and European public discourse, the West thus is widely referred to in the singular, a universal, substantive form of perfectibility that is integrating all parts of the world based on the growth of Western reason. A very similar anti-Western counter-discourse, also steeped in Western reasoning, exists in Asia. The voices proclaiming the dawn of Asia's civilizational primacy may shift from yesterday's Japan to today's China and tomorrow's India, but these voices are growing louder. Like Orientalism, Occidentalism characterizes East and West in the singular. I argue here that the internal pluralism of civilizations is reinforced by a larger context in which they are embedded. That context is not the international system or global markets, frequently deployed concepts that suffer from excessive sparseness and abstraction. It is instead a global ecumene that expresses not a common standard, but a loose sense of shared values, entailing often contradictory notions of diversity in a common humanity. This loose sense of shared values centers on the material and psychological well-being of all humans. Well-being and the rights of all humans are no longer the prerogative or product of any one civilization or constellation, or constellation of civilizations or political structures. Instead, technology serving human well-being and norms of human rights are deterritorialized processes that have taken on a life of their own and provide the script for all civilizations and all polities. This ecumene does not specify the political route towards implementation. It does offer a script, often not adhered to, that provides everywhere today the basis for political authority and legitimacy. All polities claim to serve the well-being of individuals, and all individuals are acknowledged to have inherent rights. The existence of these processes enhances the pluralism that inheres in civilizations. It undercuts both the imperialism of imposing single standards and the relativism of accepting all political practices. Recognition of the importance of this global ecumene is central to the trenchant self-critique that William McNeil wrote in his own brilliant book, of, of his own brilliant book, The Rise of the West, more than a quarter of a century after he had completed it and six years before the publication of Huntington's book. For McNeil, civilizations are internally variegated, loosely coupled, elite-centered social systems that are integrated in a commonly shared global context. He argues that his earlier path-breaking book was wrong-headed. It was based on the faulty assumption of the existence of civilizations conceived as separate groupings whose interaction was the main engine of world history. Instead, McNeil insists now that an adequate account must give proper consideration to the broader context in which all civilizations are now embedded. Since civilizations are internally differentiated, they transplant selectively. And since they are loosely integrated, they generate debates and contestations that tend to make them salient to others. What historically was true for South Asia and the Islamic world, under the impact of modern communications technologies, 
is even more true for all contemporary, civil, all contemporary civilizations. A global ecumene pluralizes civilizations within a loose sense of shared values. Such a pluralist conceptualization of civilization is attuned to the emergence of new forces, cultural and political, that reflects on the richness of the politically available repertoires of different civilizations. Analysis of pluralist civilizations stresses the balance of human practices. Shifting balances are producing and reproducing behavioral and symbolic boundaries within and between civilizations that are more or less closely tied to political power. Islamicization offers ready-made examples. Viewed globally and historically, Islamicization centered on Indonesia, an important way station between Canton, South Asia, and the Arab Peninsula. Indonesia's Islamicization was peaceful. The work of Sufi missionaries from Gujarat and Bengal, whose outlook was quite compatible with Hinduism. This focus on Indonesia, furthermore, serves as a useful reminder that today Arabs make up only 15% of the world's total Muslim population, with South and Southeast Asia accounting for more than half of the world's total. Indonesia has the world's largest Muslim population, and Islam acts as a strong unifying force for a fragmented archipelago. Although almost 90% of Indonesians are Muslim, Indonesia is not an Islamic state, and Islam is not the national faith. Contemporary media coverage suggests that Islamicization centers on the violence perpetrated by tiny sects of radicals of the world's 1.2 billion Muslims. Many academics and members of the general public appreciate, however, that Islamicization encompasses also other practices, such as the annual Hajj and long-term migration, a fully developed consumption culture, including food, dress, and pop culture, and transnational communication channels, radio in the era of Pan-Arabism in the 1950s and 1960s, Al Jazeera satellite TV, and websites such as Islam Online Today. Islamicization is dynamic and open-ended, and it defies easy summary under simplified labels. This pluralist and ecumenical view differs starkly from Samuel Huntington's unitary conception of civilization. His civilizations are operating in an international system rather than a global ecumene. Hence, Huntington articulates as a policy maxim the commonalities rule, pointing as an urgent need to something that exists already in abundance, the search for values, institutions, and practices that are shared across civilizations. In his view, civilizations balance power rather than reflecting open-ended processes and a broad range of human practices. Neglecting all the evidence of a restless, pluralist, and at times seething West, Huntington's analysis sees the West as a civilizationally reactive status quo power that reluctantly engages in the upsurge of revisionist non-Western civilizations. Rather than focusing exclusively on actors such as states, polities, or empires that are embedded in civilizational complexes, in Huntington's analysis, civilizations themselves become actors, and implausibly, he measures civilizational power solely by material capabilities, such as population, GNP, and military expenditures. His clash of civilizations thus looks remarkably similar to a clash of large states or empires. Though lacking in conceptual richness and empirical support, unitary conceptions of civilizations are very popular outside of academia. How do we account for their broad appeal? Primordiality is a simplifying crystallization of social consciousness around nodes such as civilization, gender, and race. What matters is not so much the category in and of itself, but the political act of reification, the public exposure it receives, and the fact that it is believed in. It is a testimony to Huntington's political acumen and ability to, frame, to have framed our understanding of world politics in terms of binary and totalistic entities such as the West and the rest. Even though such entities have never existed in the past, do not exist in the present, and will never exist in the future. This mental map makes sense only if one adheres to a unified conception of civilizations and is then willing to generalize broadly. 
Huntington understood perfectly well that primordiality is political, and he acknowledged very candidly that his book was very much a political project. Yet primordiality is subject to empirical analysis. It has greater appeal in some situations than in others. Simplifications have intuitive appeal in moments of great uncertainty, when the world has lost its familiar structure and when we are groping to find new beginnings in the old debris. The category of the West served that function both after the end of World War II, as Patrick Jackson has demonstrated, and after the end of the Cold War, as reflected in Huntington's civilizational thesis. Furthermore, simplifications are intuitively plausible and politically almost unavoidable in moments of extreme threat or war. Uncertainty, threat, or war focuses the mind on what divides us from our enemies and what unites us with our friends. I've argued here that we should think of civilizations in the plural rather than in unitary terms. Civilizations are embedded in a global context of knowledge and practice that influences them without robbing them of their distinctiveness. They represent what Schmuel Eisenstadt and others have called multiple modernities, which activate different cultural programs under new conditions. The emergence, for example, of Judeo-Christian and Afro-Islamic patterns of identity and practice in world politics points to the combinatorial richness of civilizational politics. Civilizations normally appeal to and are salient for others when they display diversity in debates over different but related social visions and political purposes. But in exceptional periods, such as times of great uncertainty, threat, or war, political and intellectual entrepreneurs everywhere can create primordial constructions that make us see the world in unitary terms. Let me turn to the second part of the lecture. Civilizations are pluralist. For purpose of illustrations, I'm using here the unexceptional American and Chinese cases of plural and pluralist civilizational politics. The recent and distant history of the West invalidates the claim that it has been culturally cohesive with an unchanging collective identity. Recently, after World War II, the most determined enemy of the West, Germany, was firmly integrated into a collision of Western civilized democracies. Furthermore, in the second half of the 20th century, despite the importance of the Anglo-American model, these capitalist varieties, which I mentioned, have persisted. In the distant past, medieval Europe, according to Karl Deutsch, featured six separate civilizational strands. Monastic Christianity around the Mediterranean, Latin Christendom in Western and Central Europe, and Byzantium in Southeastern Europe. These three major civilizations were connected by the Afro-Eurasian trade networks of, of Islam, which for centuries took hold on the Iberian Peninsula, as well as elements of two other trading civilizations, Jews and Vikings. The West is undeniably plural. What is true of the West is true of America. Roger Smith has reworked an older scholarly perspective on dueling traditions, such as Jeffersonianism and Madisonianism, that preceded an important book by Louis Hortz. In so doing, he has developed the multiple tradition perspective now closely associated with his name. Addressing, among others, both Hortz's and Huntington's single tradition theories, Smith observes in his analysis that American political development was marked not only by egalitarian value, values of liberal democracy, but also by inegalitarian and illiberal ideas that yielded substantial and serious clashes over America's reigning ideas and practices. At its heart, Smith argues, the multiple tradition thesis holds that not any one tradition, but a more complex pattern of apparently inconsistent combinations of traditions has shaped American history. Specifically, Hartz's liberal tradition argument overlooks America's republican and racial traditions. For Hartz, conflict in America occurs within the liberal tradition for example, between majority rule and minority rights, or between democratic and property rights. He thus overlooks America's strong Republican tradition. The rejection of monarchism led to the support of popular Republicanism informed by Rome and the ideals of civic virtue. This Republican tradition had strong effects on Jeffersonian and Jacksonian conceptions of politics and a distinctive form of American communitarianism. 
Furthermore, Hartz's liberal tradition argument has very little to say about the issue of race. In semi-feudal Latin America, slaves were placed at the very bottom of the social hierarchy, but they were not robbed of their humanity. In America's non-feudal culture, slaves were denied of their humanity and made pieces of property. Liberal slavery was thus more cruel and vicious than feudal slavery. But Hartz went on to argue that once humanity was granted, liberalism was more generous, since it did not have within its own intellectual tradition arguments that could stop the demand for equality. The elimination of slavery was necessary to establish the hegemony of liberalism in Hartz's argument. Yet Hartz slighted the importance of race in American politics, a fact he reportedly regretted uh, subsequently. American political and legal history reflect fundamental disagreements as American governors and judges frequently deviated from liberal doctrine by appealing to republicanism on the one hand and to an ethnocultural Americanism on the other. Republicanism is strengthened by social homogeneity and small size, patriotism and community. Ethnocultural Americanism is grounded in nativist and racial identities. Lockean liberalism and Anglo-Protestant creed were particular and exclusive, not general and inclusive. Blacks and Native Americans specifically were explicitly excluded for many decades. Among Democrats in the 19th century, Jacksonianism elaborated racist ideas. Among Republicans, specific ethnic and religious attributes became constitutive of America as a redeemer nation. By the late 19th century, both parties favored immigration restrictions as social Darwinism replaced older racist theories. America's multiple political traditions, liberal, republican, and race-based, were reflected in the exclusion of women from the franchise and in anti-Chinese immigration legislation. Because of race, gender, and national origin, Smith argues, United States laws declared the majority of the world's population to be ineligible for full citizenship for over 80% of American history. For the same reason, at least half of the domestic adult population was ineligible for full citizenship for about two-thirds of American history. Instead of the primacy of any single tradition, America has evolved multiple political traditions. Let me shift to China. China. 